Do you feel a shiver up your spine from fear? Yes, it's another story from the Nightshade Diary. You know what that means. Check under the bed and make sure no one or nothing is there. Is the closet door securely shut? Then leave your disbelief behind. Amp up your imagination and hang on tight for another ride into terror and mystery. And like all good horror stories, just imagine it's a dark and stormy night. And remember, screaming like a little girl is permitted. The Silver Hatchet by Sir Arthur Conan Doyle on the 3rd of December, 1861, Dr. Otto von Hopstein, Regis Professor of Comparative Anatomy of the University of Budapest and Curator of the Academical Museum, was foully and brutally murdered within a stone throw of the entrance to the college quadrangle. Beside the imminent position of the victim and his popularity amongst both students and townsfolk, there were other circumstances which excited public interest very strongly and drew general attention throughout Austria and Hungary to this murder. The Pester Abendblatt of the following day had an article upon it, which may still be consulted by the curious, and from which I translate a few passages giving a succinct account of the circumstances under which the crime was committed, and the peculiar features in the case which puzzled the Hungarian police. It appears, said that very excellent paper, that Professor von Hopstein left the university about half past four in the afternoon in order to meet the train which is due from Vienna at three minutes after five. He was accompanied by his old and dear friend, Herr Wilhelm Schlesinger, sub-curator of the museum and privacent of chemistry. The object of these two gentlemen in meeting this particular train was to receive the legacy bequeathed by Graf von Schuling to the University of Budapest. It is well known that this unfortunate nobleman, whose tragic fate is still fresh in the recollection of the public, left his unique collection of medieval weapons, as well as several priceless black letter editions to enrich the already celebrated museum of his alma mater. The worthy professor was too much of an enthusiast in such matters to entrust the reception or care of this valuable legacy to any subordinate, and with the assistance of Herr Schlesinger, he succeeded in removing the whole collection from the train and stowing it away in a light cart which had been sent by the university authorities. Most of the books and more fragile articles were packed in cases of pine wood but many of the weapons were simply done round with straw, so that considerable labor was involved in moving them all. The professor was so nervous, however, lest any of them should be injured that he refused to allow any of the railway employees, Eisen Bondinier, to assist. Every article was carried across a platform by Herr Schlesinger and handed to Professor von Hopstein in the cart who packed it away. When everything was in, the two gentlemen, still faithful to their charge, drove back to the university, the professor being in excellent spirits and not a little proud of the physical exertion which he had shown himself capable of. He made some joking allusion to it to Remenmal, the janitor who was with his friend Schiffer, a Bohemian Jew, met the cart on its return and unloaded the contents. Leaving his curiosity safe in the storeroom and locking the door, the professor handed the key to his sub-curator and bidding everyone good evening, departed in the direction of his lodgings. Schlesinger took a last look to reassure himself that all was right and also went off, leaving Renmal and his friend Schiffer smoking in the janitor's lodge. At eleven o'clock, about an hour and a half after von Hopstein's departure, a soldier of the 14th Regiment of Jaeger, passing the front of the university on his way to barracks, came upon the lifeless body of the professor lying a little away from the side of the road. He had fallen upon his face with both hands stretched out. His head was literally split in two halves, by a tremendous blow, which it is conjectured must have been struck from behind, there remaining a peaceful smile upon the old man's face, as if he had been still dwelling upon his new archaeological acquisition when death had overtaken him. There is no other mark of violence upon the body except a bruise over the left patella, caused probably by the fall. The most mysterious part of the affair is that the professor's purse containing 43 gilden and his valuable watch have been untouched. Robbery cannot, therefore, have been the incentive to the deed, unless the assassins were disturbed before they could complete their work. The idea is negatived by the fact that the body must have lain in at least an hour before anyone discovered it. The whole affair is wrapped in mystery. Dr. Langman, the eminent medical jurist, had pronounced that the wound 
as such as might have been inflicted by a heavy sword bayonet wielded by a powerful arm. The police are extremely reticent upon the subject, and it is suspected that they are in possession of a clue which may lead to important results. Thus far, the pastor Abenblatt. The researchers of the police failed, however, to throw the least glimmer of light upon the matter. There was absolutely no trace of the murderer, nor could any amount of ingenuity invent any reason which could have induced anyone to commit the dreadful deed. The deceased professor was a man so wrapped in his own studies and pursuits that he lived apart from the world and had certainly never raised the slightest animosity in any human breast. It must have been some fiend, some savage, who loved blood for its own sake, who struck that merciless blow. Though the officials were unable to come to any conclusions upon the matter, popular suspicion was not long in pitching upon a scapegoat. In the first published accounts of the murder, the name of one Schiffer had been mentioned as having remained with the janitor after the professor's departure. This man had never been popular in Hungary. A cry was at once raised for Schiffer's arrest, but as there was not the slightest grain of evidence against him, the authorities very properly refused to consent to so arbitrary a proceeding. Rin Mal, who was an old and most respected citizen, declared solemnly that Schiffer was with him until the startled cry of the soldier had caused them both to run out to the scene of the tragedy. No one ever dreamed of implicating Rin Mal in such a matter, but still it was rumored that his ancient and well-known friendship for Schiffer might have induced him to tell falsehood in order to screen him. Popular feeling ran very high upon the subject, and there seemed a danger of Schiffer's being mobbed in the street, but an incident occurred which threw a very different light upon the matter. On the morning of the 12th of December, just nine days after the mysterious murder of the professor, Schiffer the Bohemian was found lying in the northwestern corner of the Grand Plot's stone dead, and so mutilated that he was hardly recognizable. His head was cloven open in very much the same way as that of von Hauptstein, and his body exhibited numerous deep gashes, as if the murderer had been so carried away and transported with fury that he had continued to hack the lifeless body. Snow had fallen heavily the day before and was lying at least a foot deep all over the square. Some had fallen during the night, too, as was evidenced by a thin layer lying like a winding sheet over the murdered man. It was hoped at first that this circumstance might assist in giving a clue by enabling the footsteps of the assassin to be traced. But the crime had been committed, unfortunately, in a place much frequented during the day, and there were innumerable tracks in every direction. Besides, the newly fallen snow had blurred the footsteps to such an extent that it would have been impossible to draw trustworthy evidence from them. In this case, there was exactly the same impenetrable mystery and absence of motive which had characterized the murder of Professor von Hopstein. In the dead man's pocket, there was found a notebook containing a considerable sum in gold and several very valuable bills, but no attempt had been made to rifle him. Supposing that anyone to whom he had lent money, and this was the first idea which occurred to the police, had taken this means of evading his debt. It was hardly conceivable that he would have left such a valuable spoil untouched. Schiffer lodged to the widow named Gruga, at 49 Marie Theresa Strasse, and the evidence of his landlady and her children showed that he had remained shut up in his room the whole of the preceding day in a state of deep dejection, caused by a suspicion which the populace had fastened upon him. She had heard him go out about 11 o'clock at night for his last and fatal walk, and as he had a latch key, she had gone to bed without waiting for him. His object in choosing such a late hour for a ramble obviously was they did not consider himself safe if recognized in the streets. The occurrence of the second murder, so shortly after the first, threw not only the town of Budapest, but the whole of Hungary, into a terrible state of excitement and even of terror. Vague danger seemed to hang over the head of every man. The only parallel to this intense feeling was to be found in our own country at the time of the Williams murders described by De Quincey. There were so many resemblances between the cases of von Hopstein and of Schiffer, that no one could doubt that there existed a connection between the two. The absence of object and of robbery, the utter want of any clue to the assassin, and lastly, the ghastly nature of the wounds, evidently inflicted by the same or similar weapon, all pointed in one direction. Things were in this state when the incidents which I am now about to relate occurred, and in order to make them intelligible, 
I must lead up to them from a fresh point of departure. Otto von Schlegel was a younger son of the old Silesian family of that name. His family had originally destined him for the army, but at the advice of his teachers, who saw the surprising talent of the youth, had sent him to the University of Budapest to be educated in medicine. Here, Jan Schlegel carried everything before him and promised to be one of the most brilliant graduates turned out for many a year. Though a hard reader, he was no bookworm, but an active, powerful young fellow, full of animal spirits and vivacity and extremely popular among his fellow students. The New Year examinations were at hand and Schlegel was working hard, so hard that even the strange murders in the town and the general excitement in mines failed to turn his thoughts from his studies. Upon Christmas Eve, when every house was illuminated and the roar of drinking songs came from the beer keller in the student quarter, he refused the many invitations to roistering suppers, which were showered upon him, and went off with his books under his arm to the rooms of Leopold Strauss to work with him into the small hours of the morning. Strauss and Schlegel were bosom friends. They were both Silesians and had known each other from boyhood. Their affection had become proverbial in the university. Strauss was almost as distinguished a student as Schlegel, and there had been many a rough struggle for academic honors between the two fellow countrymen, which had only served to strengthen their friendship by a bond of mutual respect. Schlegel admired the dog, pluck, and never-failing good temper of his old playmate, while the latter considered Schlegel, with his many talents and brilliant versatility, the most accomplished of mortals. The friends were still working together, the one reading from a volume on anatomy, the other holding a skull and marking off the various parts mentioned in the text, when the deep-toned bell of St. Gregory's Church struck the hour of midnight. Hark to that, said Schlegel, snapping up the book and stretching out his long legs towards the cheery fire. Why, it's Christmas morning, old friend. May it not be the last that we spend together. May we have passed all these confounded examinations before another one comes, answered Strauss. But see here, Otto, one bottle of wine will not be amiss. I have laid one up on purpose, and with a smile on his honest South German face, he pulled out a long neck bottle of Rhenish from among a pile of books and bones in the corner. It is a night to be comfortable indoors, said Otto von Schlegel, looking at the snowy landscape, for tis bleak and bitter enough outside. Good health, Leopold. Liebe Hock, replied his companion. It is a comfort indeed to forget Snefnoi Boins and Emtoin Boins, if it is but for a moment. And what is the news of the Corps, Otto? Has Grub fought the Swabian? They fight tomorrow, said von Schlagel. I fear that our man will lose his beauty, for he has shortened the arm. Yet activity and skill may do much for him. They say his hanging guard is perfection. And what else is the news amongst the students? asked Strauss. They talk, I believe, of nothing but the murders. But I have worked hard of late, as you know, and hear little of the gossip. Have you had time, inquired Strauss, to look over the books and the weapons, which our dear old professor was so concerned about the very day he met his death? They say they are well worth a visit. I saw them today, said Schlegel, lighting his pipe. When Maul, the janitor, showed me over the storeroom, and I helped to label many of them from the original catalog of Graf Schuling's museum. As far as we can see, there is but one article missing of all the collection. One missing? exclaimed Strauss. That would grieve old von Hopstein's ghost. Is it anything of value? It is described as an antique hatchet with a head of steel and a handle of chased silver. We have applied to the railway company and no doubt it will be found. I trust so, echoed Strauss and the conversation drifted into other channels. The fire was burning low, and the bottle of Rhenish was empty before the two friends rose from the chairs and von Schlegel prepared to depart. Ah, oh, it is a bitter night, he said, standing on the doorstep and folding his cloak around him. Why, Leopold, you have your cap on. You are not going out, are you? Yes, I am coming with you, said Strauss, shutting the door behind him. I feel heavy, he continued, taking his friend's arm and walking down the street with him. I think a walk as far as your lodging in the crisp frosty air is just the thing to set me right. The two students went down the Stephen Strauss together and across Julian Platz, talking on a variety of topics. As they passed the corner of the Grand Platz, however, where Schiffer had been found dead, the conversation turned naturally upon the murder. That's where they found him, remarked von Schlegel, pointing to the fatal spot. Perhaps the murderer is near us now, said Strauss. Let us hasten on. They both turned to go and von Schlegel gave a sudden cry of pain and stooped down. Something has cut through my boot, he cried, 
and feeling about with his hand in the snow, he pulled out a small glistening battle axe, made apparently entirely of metal. It had been lying with the blade turned slightly upward so as to cut the foot of the student when he trod upon it. The weapon of the murderer, he ejaculated. The silver hatchet from the museum, cried Strauss in the same breath. There could be no doubt that it was both the one and the other. There could not be two such curious weapons, and the character of the wounds was just as such would be inflicted by a similar instrument. The murderer had evidently thrown it aside after committing the dreadful deed, and had lain concealed in the snow some twenty meters from the spot ever since. It was extraordinary that of all the people who had passed and repassed, none had discovered it. But the snow was deep, and it was a little off the beaten track. What are we to do with it? said von Schlegel, holding it in his hand. He shuddered as he noticed by the light of the moon that the head of it was all dabbled with dark brown stains. Take it to the commissary of police, suggested Strauss. He'll be in bed now. Still, I think you are right. But it's nearly four o'clock. I will wait until morning and take it round before breakfast. Meanwhile, I must carry it with me to my lodgings. That is the best plan, said his friend, and the two walked on together, talking of the remarkable find which they had made. When they came to Schlegel's door, Strauss said goodbye, refusing an invitation to go in, and walked briskly down the street in the direction of his own lodgings. Schlegel was stooping down, putting the key into the lock, when a strange change came over him. He trembled violently, and dropped the key from his quivering fingers. His right hand closed convulsively over the handle of the silver hatchet, and his eye followed the retreating figure of his friend with a vindictive glare. In spite of the coldness of the night, the perspiration streamed down his face. For a moment he seemed to struggle with himself, holding his hand up to his throat as if he were suffocating. Then, with crouching body and rapid noiseless steps, he crept after his late companion. Strauss was plodding sturdily along through the snow, humming snatches of a student's song and a little dreaming of the dark figure which pursued him. At the Grand Plot it was forty yards behind him, at the Julian Platz it was but twenty, and Stephen Strauss it was ten, and gaining on him with panther-like rapidity. Already it was almost within arm's length of the unsuspecting man, and the hatchet glittered coldly in the moonlight, when some slight noise must have reached Strauss's ear, for he faced suddenly round upon his pursuer. He started and uttered an exclamation as his eyes met the white set face with flashing eyes and clenched teeth which seemed to be suspended in the air behind him. What? Otto! he exclaimed, recognizing his friend. Art thou ill? You look pale. Come with me to my... Are you... Hold you, madman, hold! Drop that axe! Drop it, I say, or by heaven I'll choke you! Von Schlegel had thrown himself upon him with a wild cry, an uplifted weapon, but the student was stout-hearted and resolute. He rushed inside the sweep of the hatchet and caught his assailant around the waist, narrowly escaping a blow which would have cloven his head. The two staggered for a moment in a deadly wrestle, Schlegel endeavoring to shorten his weapon, but Strauss with a desperate wrench managed to bring him to the ground, and they rolled together in the snow, Strauss clinging to the other's right arm and shouting frantically for assistance. It was as well that he did so, for Schlegel could certainly have succeeded in freeing his arm had it not been for the arrival of two stalwart gendarmes attracted by the uproar. Even then, the three of them found it difficult to overcome the maniacal strength of Schlegel, and they were utterly unable to wrench the silver hatchet from his grasp. One of the gendarmes, however, had a coil of rope around his waist, with which he rapidly secured the student's arms to his sides. In this way, half pushed, half dragged, he was conveyed, in spite of furious cries and frenzied struggles, to the central police station. Strauss assisted in coercing his former friend and accompanied the police to the station, protesting loudly at the same time against any unnecessary violence and giving it as his opinion that a lunatic asylum would be a more fitting place for the prisoner. The events of the last half hour had been so sudden and inexplicable that he felt quite dazed himself. What did it all mean? It was certain that his old friend from boyhood had attempted to murder him and had nearly succeeded. Was von Schlegel then the murderer Professor on Hopstein and of the Bohemian? Strauss felt that it was impossible for the Bohemian was not even known to him and the professor had been his especial favorite. He followed mechanically to the police station, lost in grief and amazement. Inspector Baumgarten, one of the most energetic and best known of the police officials, was on duty in the absence of the commissary. He was a wiry little active man, quiet and retiring in his habits, but possessed of great sagacity and a vigilance which never relaxed. Now, though, he had six hours of vigil, and he sat as erect as ever, 
with his pen behind his ear at his official desk, while his friend, Sub-Inspector Winkle, snored in a chair at the side of the stove. Even the inspector's usually immovable features betrayed surprise. However, when the door was flung open and Moshlega was dragged in with pale face and disordered clothes, the silver hatchet still grasped firmly in his hand. Still more surprised was he when Strauss and the gendarmes gave their account, which was duly injured in the official register. Young man, young man, said Inspector Baumgarten, laying down his pen and fixing his eyes sternly upon the prisoner. That is pretty work for Christmas morning. Why have you done this thing? God knows, cried Bachelago, covering his face with his hands and dropping the hatchet. A change had come over him. His fury and excitement were gone, and he seemed utterly prostrated with grief. You have rendered yourself liable to a strong suspicion of having committed the other murders, which have disgraced our city. No, no, indeed, said Von Schlagel earnestly. God forbid. At least you are guilty of attempting the life of Frau Leopold Strauss. The dearest friend I have in the world, groaned the student. How could I? How could I? His being your friend makes your crime ten times more heinous, said the inspector severely. Remove him for the remainder of the night to the... But steady, who comes here? The door was pushed open, and a man came into the room, so haggard and careworn that he looked more like a ghost than a human being. He tottered as he walked and had to clutch at the backs of the chairs as he approached the inspector's desk. It was hard to recognize in this miserable-looking object the once cheerful and rubicon sub-curator of the museum and private docent of chemistry, her Wilhelm Schlesinger. The practice eye of Baumgarten, however, was not to be baffled by any change. Good morning, Menher, he said. You are up early. No doubt the reason is that you have heard that one of your students, von Schlegel, is arrested for attempting the life of Leopold Strauss. No, I have come for myself, said Schlesinger, speaking huskily and putting his hand up to his throat. I have come to ease my soul of the weight of a great sin, though God knows an unmeditated one. It was I who... But merciful heavens, there it is, the horrid thing. Oh, that I have never seen it. He shrank back in a paroxysm of terror, glaring at the silver hatchet where it lay upon the floor and pointing at it with his emaciated hand. There it lies, he yelled. Look at it. It has come to condemn me. See that brown rust on it? Do you know what that is? That is the blood of my dearest, best friend, Professor von Hopstein. I saw it gush over the very handle as I drove the blade through his brain. Men got. I see it now. Sub-Inspector Winkle, said Baumgarten, endeavoring to preserve his official austerity. You will arrest this man, charged on his own confession with the murder of the late professor. I also deliver into your hands von Schlegel here, charged with murderous assault upon Herr Strauss. You will also keep this hatchet, here he picked it from the floor, which has apparently been used for both crimes. Wilhelm Schlesinger had been leaning against the table with a face of ashy paleness. As the inspector ceased speaking, he looked up excitedly. What did you say, he cried? Von Schlegel attacked Strauss? The two dearest friends in the colleges? I slay my old master. It is magic. I say it is a charm. There's a spell upon us. It is, I have it. It is the hatchet, that thrice cursed hatchet. And he pointed convulsively at the weapon, which Inspector Baumgarten still held in his hand. The inspector smiled contemptuously. Restrain yourself, Menher, he said. You do but make your case worse by such wild excuses for the wicked deed you confess to. Magic and charms are not known in the legal vocabulary, as my friend Winkle will assure you. I know not, remarked his sub-inspector, shrugging his broad shoulders. There are many strange things in the world. Who knows but that... What? roared Inspector Baumgarten furiously. You would undertake to contradict me? You would set up your opinion? You would be the champion of these accursed murderers? fool miserable fool your hour has come and rushing at the astounded winkle he dealt a blow at him with a silver hatchet which would certainly have justified his last assertion had it not been that in his fury overlooked the lowness of the rafters above his head the blade of the hatchet struck one of these and remained there quivering while the handle was splintered into a thousand pieces what have i done gasped baumgarten falling back into his chair what have i done you have proved Herr Schlesinger's words to be correct, said von Schlegel, stepping forward, for the astonished policemen had let go their grasp of him. That is what you have done, against reason, science, and everything else though it be. There is a charm at work. There must be. 
Strauss, old boy, you know I would not my right senses hurt one hair of your head. And you, Schlesinger, we both know you love the old man who is dead. And you, Inspector Baumgarten, you would not willingly have struck your friend, the sub-inspector. Not for the whole world, groaned the inspector, covering his face with his hands. Then, is it not clear? But now, thank heaven, the accursed thing is broken and can never do harm again. But see, what is that? Right in the center of the room was lying a thin brown cylinder of parchment. One glance at the fragments of the handle of the weapon showed that it had been hollowed. This roll of paper had apparently been hidden away inside the metal case thus formed, having been introduced through a small hole, which had been afterwards soldered up. Von Schlegel opened the document. The writing upon it was almost illegible from age, but as far as they could make out, it stood thus in medieval German. It was roughly translated to, This weapon was used by Max von Ehrlichen for the murder of Joanna Bodek. Therefore do I, Johann Bodek, accursed by the power which has been bequeathed to me as one of the Council of the Rosy Cross, may it be yield to others the grief which it has dealt to me. May every hand that grasps it be read in the blood of a friend. Ever evil, never good, written with a loved one's blood. There was a dead silence in the room when Wachlegel had finished spelling out this strange document. As he put it down, Strauss laid his hand affectionately upon his arm. No such proof is needed by me, old friend, he said. At the very moment that you struck at me, I forgave you in my heart. I well know that if the poor professor were in the room, he would say as much to her Wilhelm Schlesinger. Gentlemen, remarked the inspector, standing up and resuming his official tones. This affair, strange as it is, must be treated according to rule and precedent. Sub-Inspector Winkle, as your superior officer, I command you to arrest me upon a charge of murderously assaulting you. You will commit me to prison for the night, together with Herr von Schlegel and Herr Wilhelm Schlesinger. We shall take our trial at the coming sitting of the judges. In the meantime, take care of that piece of evidence, pointing to the piece of parchment, and while I am away, devote your time and energy to utilizing the clue you have obtained the discovering who it was who slew her Schiffer and the Bohemian. The one missing link in the chain of evidence was soon supplied. On the 20th of December, the wife of Reynmal, the janitor, coming into the bedroom after a short absence, found her husband hanging lifeless from a hook in the wall. He had tied a long bolster case around his neck and stood upon a chair in order to commit the fatal deed. On the table was a note in which he confessed to the murder of Schiffer, adding that the deceased had been his oldest friend and that he had slain him without premeditation in obedience to some uncontrollable impulse. Remorse and grief, he said, had driven him to self-destruction and he wound up his confession by commending his soul to the mercy of heaven. The trial which ensued was one of the strangest which ever occurred in the whole history of jurisprudence. It was in vain that the prosecuting counsel urged the improbability of the explanation offered by the prisoners and deprecated the introduction of such an element as magic into a 19th century law court. The chain of facts was too strong and the prisoners were unanimously acquitted. This silver hatchet, remarked the judge in his summing up, has hung untouched upon the wall in the mansion of the Graf von Schuling for nearly 200 years. The shocking manner in which he met his death at the hands of his favorite house steward is still fresh in your recollection. It has come out in the evidence that a few days before the murder, the steward had overhauled the old weapons and cleaned them. In doing this, he must have touched the handle of his hatchet. Immediately afterward, he slew his master, whom he had served faithfully for 20 years. The weapon then came in conformity with the Count's will to Budapest, where at the station, her Wilhelm Schlesinger grasped it and within two hours used it against the person of the deceased professor. The next man whom we find touched it is the janitor Raymond, who helped to remove the weapons from the cart to the storeroom. At the first opportunity, he buried it in the body of his friend Schiffer. We then have the attempted murder of Strauss by Schlegel and of Winkle by Inspector Baumgarten, all immediately following the taking of the hatchet into the hand. Lastly comes the provincial discovery of the extraordinary document which has been read to you by the clerk of the court. I invite you, most careful consideration, gentlemen of the jury, to this chain of facts knowing that you will find a verdict according to your conscience without fear and without favor. Perhaps the most interesting piece of evidence to the English reader 
though it found few supporters among the Hungarian audience, was that of Dr. Langman, the eminent medical jurist who had written textbooks upon metallurgy and toxicology. He said, I am not so sure, gentlemen, that there is need to fall upon necromancy or the black art for an explanation of what has occurred. What I say is merely a hypothesis, without proof of any sort, but in a case so extraordinary, every suggestion may be of value. The Rosicrucians, to whom allusion is made in this paper, were the most profound chemists of the early Middle Ages, and included the principal alchemists whose names have descended to us. Much as chemistry has advanced, there are some points in which the ancients were ahead of us, and in none more so than the manufacture of poisons of subtle and deadly action. This man, Bodek, as one of the elders of the Rosicrucians, possessed no doubt the recipe of many such mixtures, some of which, like the aqua tofana of the Medicis, would poison by ten penetrating through the pores of the skin. It is conceivable that the handle of the silver hatchet has been anointed by some preparation which is a diffusible poison, having the effect upon the human body of bringing on a sudden and acute attack of homicidal mania. In such attacks, it is well known that the madman's rage is turned against those whom he loved best when sane. I have, as I remarked before, no proof to support me in my theory, and simply put it forward for what it is worth. With this extract from the speech of the learned and genius professor, we may close the account of this famous trial. The broken pieces of the silver hatchet were thrown into a deep pond, a clever poodle being employed to carry them in his mouth as no one would touch them for fear some of the infection might still hang about them. The piece of parchment was preserved in the museum of the university. As to Strauss and Schlegel, Winkel and Baumgarten, they continued the best of friends and are so still, for all I know, to the contrary. Schlesinger became surgery of a cavalry regiment and was shot at the Battle of Sadowa five years later while rescuing the wounded under heavy fire. By his last injunctions, his little patrimony was to be sold to erect a marble obelisk over the grave of Professor von Hopstein.